Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us tonight. My name is Stephanie Friedhoff. I'm one of the co-directors of the Information Futures Lab, together with Dr. Claire Wardle, my partner in crime. It's fantastic to see you here tonight. It's also great to have folks on the live stream. I believe um, some colleagues from Oakland are definitely there. Uh, and, and other cities uh, where our fellows come from, and, and more broadly, I, I am sure. Um, I'm going to start out by introducing our dean, um, Dr. Ron O'Bear, who will be giving some welcoming remarks for us tonight. Um, Ron, thank you for being our fearless leader over the past 10 months. <laughs> As you guys know, uh, Ron is an epidemiologist, a researcher, and a practitioner. He's very much like all of us here who have strong connections between both research and practice. He's led the school with compassion and vision for a school that starts with sort of a commitment to equity and excellence. And I'm looking forward to hearing your introduction to our panel tonight, Ron. Here messing up everything. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and thank you, Claire. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We are really excited to have you all here tonight. Uh, my name is Ronald Bear, as Stephanie indicated. Um, I want to thank you for being here and acknowledge how fortunate we are to have uh, such expertise at the Brown School of Public Health. Um, we are really happy that we have the, the folks like Stephanie and Claire to, <clears throat> to put together this this fellows program and for us to be able to kick this off tonight to, to and for you get, get, to have the chance to get to hear from the people who are going to be participating in, with the fellows or in the fellows program. So a big welcome and thank you to our six contributing fellows with our, that are here with us today. There are two others who are not here. Um, but Adrian, Sophia, Kelly, Kelsey, Elizabeth, Lam, and I look forward to hearing from all of you and getting to know more about the projects. I have, I've had the, the sneak preview because I uh, was able to attend um, a reception on Sunday night, and you're going to be totally blown away to hear what these young people have sort of visualized and planned and the big ideas that they have. And uh, this is a great opportunity to facilitate and to nurture that and to see what amazing work they're going to embark on. So. Without that, without further ado, I'll get started. I'll pass this over to Claire to kick us. Oh, pass it back to Stephanie <laughs> to get this going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, as Rana said, we have um, some fantastic people here tonight, and I won't take too much time, but I wanted to briefly talk for a moment about why do we have the IFL here at Brown and why do we have a fellowship? Why is that one of the things we wanted to do almost immediately as we got started here? The Information Futures Lab is a place where, yes, we talk about misinformation, but we also talk about information. We talk about what can we do to have better and healthier information spaces? What do we actually want to see? from the places where we get our information and how do we want to interact with each other in those spaces. We're trying to take a look forward and we're trying to create a space for innovation and that's where our fellows come in. We've learned a lot from this pandemic. You know, one of our fellows is an infodemics manager and has spent uh, her, her days in the trenches of the darker corners of the internet. Um, at the same time, we've seen remarkable innovation in this pandemic. We've seen the folks on the ground and everybody who's here tonight has done the hard work of communicating in this pandemic to different communities in different settings in different countries. We've seen that hard work, but often it doesn't get evaluated. We've seen research produce great results, but people on the ground don't know about it and vice versa. We've seen amazing work getting done and we in academia don't know about it. So what can we do to close those gaps? That's what this fellowship is about. That's why I'm so thrilled that you get to hear from these awesome people and why we've spent the last three days really digging into the projects and the ideas that they've come with here to create different information spaces to help us together in a multidisciplinary way 
solve some of these challenges that we're seeing and bring the best of research to that, bring the best of the methodologies, the behavioral sciences, all the different fields that we have at our fingertips here at Brown to these types of questions. I'll leave it at that. Claire will leave, uh, lead us through the discussion and the conversation with our fellows. So help me in welcoming Claire, who will introduce our panelists. Stephanie is taller than me. Um, so it's such a pleasure to see you all here. Some people don't like the month of February. Not me, it's my birthday on Friday. But other people don't like February. So I'm very pleased to see so many people here and hopefully online. Um, but we were a little bit worried that people might not want to come out on a February evening. So we were trying to think about our title. We were like, what about a BuzzFeed title? Like, six people making the future of information great again. Um, but they really are just wonderful people that we've spent much more time with recently. And I think it keeps being said, but after three years of not really spending time together, not only are we back together, but being with people who sometimes things can get a bit tough these days. Honestly, you're going to leave this room with a skip in your step because they really are doing wonderful work. So, um, but there's six of them. Oh, also to let everybody know, we do have two other fellows who are men, but I apologize <laughs> for the woman -o. Um, but I'm not apologizing, it's great. Um, so I'm just going to go down the, and they've been practicing this, which is basically the tweet length elevator pitch of their projects. Uh, so you can kind of get a little sense of what they're all about, and then we're going to do a little bit of digging in. But I'm going to start with you, Adrian, because your last name is Ammerman, so you're always first. That's right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Adrian Ammerman. I'm a health communication specialist based in Western North Carolina. And I've had the privilege of supporting a, a regional health communicators collaborative for the past four years. My Information Futures fellow, Fellows project is to design a platform that will make it easier for health communicators to locate, localize, test, measure, and share health information with their communities. Hello, I am Sophia smith Gaylor. I am a journalist and content creator with over half a million followers and 130 million TikTok views. And what I'll be piloting is uh, an online media literacy resource and package for schools delivered by content creators to help solve some of the gaps in this area, uh, particularly when it comes to misinformation and understanding how algorithms work. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Perry. I'm a public health researcher based out of the uh, FHI 360, which is an international NGO based out of the Asia Pacific Regional Office in Bangkok, Thailand, supporting and managing different public health uh, projects across Asia and the Pacific. And my fellowship project is centered on really bridging the gap between physical sciences and social sciences to center uh, citizens' voices and stories around the air pollution crisis in Thailand and trying to drive policy with raising awareness around um, the crisis. Sorry, Claire, that was not tweet length, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Scott. I am a public health educator for Roots Community Health Center out in East Oakland. And my project is to create culturally representative health information materials to allow African Americans to make more health and better health decisions um, for their lives. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Wilhelm. Um, I have been working in different um, areas of public health, but most recently on vaccine confidence and demand in the United States and globally. Um, and my project is around um, understanding the impact that the COVID-19 infodemic has had on those working on the front lines around the world on health misinformation and a participatory evaluation project to understand those impacts and offer them up to policymakers um, so that we might make better systems in the future so that we are better prepared for the next one. Um. Hi, my name is Lambo, and I am a data journalist. I am an investigative reporter, and I'm a professor at CUNY um, City um, at the journalism school there. And I guess my project is about essentially how we understand the health of the neighborhood and how neighborhood platforms like Nextdoor or Neighbors or Citizen play into game the gamification of paranoia, into moral panics around crime, and how that's really skewing the realities that in how we perceive a neighborhood these days. I don't know if you just came up with gamification of paranoia, but that's brilliant. <laughs> um, so I'm just 
<laughs> I'm just going to follow up a little bit. Um, so some of you, I did not know about the Neighbours app because I don't have a ring camera. Camera. I have one of those doorbells. Um, so Lam, there's kind of jokes about these kind of apps, which is basically, you know, it's there's a lot of misinformation and racism on these apps. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk a little bit about how you're trying to understand certain communities, particularly, well, let's talk about where you're in the Bay Area, yeah. communities who are actually relying on, on these apps to mm -hmm. understand their like threat of crime in their neighborhoods. So maybe you could just dig a little bit into that. Sure. So um, one of the things that I've been really interested in is the intersection of gentrification, racism, and policing, and technology. And like um, I think the way in which I stumbled upon the group that I want to focus on, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community in the Bay Area, was by doing a story about how citizens is pushing for Asian American elders and other folks uh, in the AAPI community to go on these apps. So now imagine you have a phone and it starts dinging. There's a crime in your neighborhood. There's a crime in your neighborhood. There's a crime in your neighborhood. Oh, there's maybe a dog missing, but also there's a crime in your neighborhood, right? <laughs> And with all of this, we start having this interesting community that is not often served in the mainstream media with the kind of information they need about their local neighborhood. And suddenly they get this imagery of crime. I think the way in which one person told me about this was, it's not really healthy to know of all crime that happens. It really reinforces certain stereotypes. Um, it's a lot of like, um, kind of like, the app takes police blotter, puts it on the app, and then lets people comment on that. So who calls the cops on whom, especially in the Bay Area? And I would like to remind you of very um, viral cases like Barbecue Becky or Permit Patty. All of these took place in um, the Bay Area. So one of them, I see you frowning a little bit. So it's Barbecue Becky is, no, 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 just to give you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> barbecue Becky is a woman who called the cops on, her, um, on a black family having a barbecue at Lake Merritt because they didn't have a quote unquote pe permit to do that. Permit Patty was a woman in 2018 who called the cops on a Latino child um, selling water without a permit. So all of these ways in which biases are reinforced through who gets to call, quote unquote, the manager um, in a neighborhood are then kind of seen through an app, seen as like verified data, and like seen as something that is then, um, is quote unquote, the crime picture of a neighborhood. What are other things that happen in the Bay Area? Like how are we measuring this, this kind of like um, health? And like how does a community that's been targeted with hate, that's been targeted with violence, suddenly come into this space and it's like, I need information to feel safe. I am underserved in my own language, in my own cultural, um, uh, um, within my own cultural community. There's no, not enough uh, ethnic media. I think according to some studies, not only has local news been dying, but um, local ethnic news has been dying a lot. Um, especially in the past 10 years. Um, and so how do we look at these communities? How do we look at an underserved community coming into a space, not necessarily posting, but lurking a lot? And so I talked to a few people, and that's really what sparked the idea of focusing on one group, is um, I've talked to a few people who really had to smarten up during a pandemic. They started seeing a lot more inequality. I think what we see a lot as crime and property crime is actually kind of an outgrowth of inequality. And what I see now is like the idea of like how do people who come from um, a mindset of not having enough information suddenly get served with this type of algorithmically warped information about just one subsection of information. Um, and yeah, I think for me, that's like something that I'm trying to really disaggregate, understand better, and then see what kind of solutions could come in the future. Because if you have a very, whatever skewed media diet that the API community in the Bay Area has, or might not have, I'm, I'm coming in hopefully with an open mind and being disproven, is hopefully gonna give us very helpful information about other communities too. Like in um, Chicago, for example, yes, there's a large contingency on neighbor, um, on citizen that is um, white, but there's also a large contingency of women, I think it's three quarters of women in um, Chicago youth citizen, and are black women um, in that neighborhood. They need to be saved too. In some ways, having the privilege of not living with crime is also something we need to acknowledge. And so what, how do we strike this balance of getting, seeing quote unquote, all crime <laughs> versus what is a better way of approaching a balanced information diet? So yeah, sorry, I'm keep staring at you, but. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's because I care about you. <laughs> and, and also, if you are kind of new to these apps, um, the other day, Alain put up a slide of the most downloaded news and information apps. Like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times was like number 19 and 20, and it was all these kind of apps that are the most downloaded in that category. So that kind of blew my mind. Mm -hmm. um, Sophia, I'm going to move to you. Uh, so you're, you're helping um, young people understand um, how to make sense of the information they're receiving online. And there are some students in the room, and they're probably like, yeah, we had some of that training at school. And they might not be like, and it was my favorite class, because it was probably an older educator who was telling them about Facebook. Um, tell us how you're going to change that. Very likely, yeah. I mean, I've really been informed by two different experiences in my life to come up with the idea for the pilot. One of them is the fact that I've become a, a content creator pioneering journalism in a new space, which put me in a position in which I was desperately trying to persuade people usually senior to me of an older generation of the importance of a platform like TikTok. Can you it's, just explain, you've worked at the BBC and now you're at Vice? Yes. But you're not talking in that capacity? Uh, yes, I was a, <laughs> yeah. I was a BBC reporter and I'm now a Vice World News reporter. Um, and I have been in the position in my former newsrooms trying to persuade people to take TikTok and uh, vertical video seriously. Uh, and these, uh, these are people who should really know where media is going in order to make their own organization survive. And they don't, aren't necessarily willing to accept the role that these platforms and content creators on those platforms now have in people's information diets. That's one thing. My other experience is as a reporter and an author in the sexual and reproductive health space, um, you get taught about this kind of thing in the UK, online media literacy, in our relationships and sex education curriculum a lot of the time, especially when there is overlap with online risk and harm. When I was at school, in, I left school in the early 2010s. Already, that curriculum had not been updated since the year 2000. Think how much internet happened in that time. <laughs> Think how much social media happened in that time, and too little has changed. If you look at the current offerings in online media literacy resources in schools, it's really not a brilliant picture for young people in the UK. For example, um, even just having a look recently at what the government recommends you, there's a, there's a website that the government have that schools can use to access free resources. The only resource about targeted advertising was made by TikTok. Um, that is not right. Uh, the people in this space offering uh, delivery methods, which are almost always resources, are charities, foundations, news organizations, who, as I've just said, often underestimate the power or role of social media platforms, and especially vertical video ones. Uh, but secondly, the, the delivery method is always resources, and it won't be delivered to the young person necessarily in the way that they desperately need it, in a way that they can really relate to. And so my pilot that's going to put the content creator in the school, in the pilot, will be me delivering it, but I'll be creating a structure from which any creator, theoretically vetted, can go into a school, talk about their practice with a structured lesson plan uh, to really deliver the user knowledge and the awareness that young people need as part of the curriculum, which is now compulsory in the UK, um, and also empower the teachers. So researchers also found that teachers really do not feel confident talking about these issues because they weren't given uh, decent online, uh, online media literacy either. So hopefully my pilot can help bridge some gaps that desperately need filling. It was my uh, investigation uh, that broke the story last year that our government withdrew half of its funding to train teachers to deliver this curriculum. This was something that the government was not revealing and was not sharing, and it re-diverted half of the budget to other departmental priorities and blamed teachers for low uptake due to the pandemic. That is not acceptable, in my opinion. Thank goodness for journalists. Um, so, Kelsey, a lot of your work, obviously, is centred in Oakland. Um, and in a presentation you gave to us earlier this week, you showed this incredible map of Oakland that showed how segregated Oakland is and how there's one particular neighbourhood that is mostly black and brown communities, but that that's where all the hospitals are. 
But the purpose of your uh, project is that many of the visual materials that people see when they visit those hospitals are not people who look like them. So when you work with, with your community, what do you hear from people about what that means in terms of trust, in terms of health um, services, and also what that means just in terms of the way people think about their own health? Yeah, so what I've noticed so far and also through conversation and questions is when folks don't see, within, within that community, when folks don't see themselves in the materials, it starts to set this ideal idea that that health um, illness does not affect them. Um, it's some, most of the material is written in a way that folks in the community do not speak or understand. And I just find it disheartening as there's this big, big push to have healthcare providers of color in these different types of neighborhoods, and yet the materials that the providers are sending home with their patients, it doesn't reflect them. And so they kind of look, people tend to look at it and it's like, oh, this doesn't look like me. Or if you take um, an image of a particular health illness that's presented in a particular document, oh, well, this condition doesn't look like the condition on me. Um, or on another person of color. A lot of the health materials, they often depict white people. And different health conditions show up differently on people of color. And that is important for everyone to know, whether you're white, black, or brown, um, because it then affects how people understand the information that is presented to them and the choices that they now make for their health. So if they are seeing something that doesn't look like them, they may not believe it's actually happening, and they're going to let it continue to go on and on to the point where something that could have been prevented is now almost past the point of prevention. And so my project is kind of to, to take that step back and really get down to the nitty gritty of information that is sent out to folks, whether it's on social media or presented in hospitals or health facilities, and really just look at it, assess it, and be like, okay, this language is not in the language that folks, particularly in the African American community, this, they don't say this. This is not how people talk or how people describe how they're feeling. And so someone will read it and was like, well, that's not a word I would use, or I'm not sure what that word means, but may not even have the confidence to ask their provider, what does this actually mean? They'll just take it, look at it, and like, eh, doesn't apply to me, toss it and then that's it. And so with the materials I plan to create, it will utilize the language and the way that folks of the African American community describe their health illnesses. And not only will it benefit those, um, that community, but also help the healthcare providers. Because they can look at it and be like, okay, so you're describing it in this manner, and you may have this. Instead of saying, you're describing it in this manner, and eh, I don't think that's right, eh, I think you're okay. You can go home now. Um, in Oakland, a lot of the health disparities are mostly within the African American community. And it's sad, because that's also replica uh, representation of what's happening in the United States. African Americans and Hispanics, they are representing, unfortunately, the higher cases of different chronic preventable chronic illnesses. And if we create materials for all communities that represent who they are via pictures, via words, then we can really help hone down and bring those preventable case rates down. Thanks, Kelsey. So Adrienne, you're also a public health communication specialist. And so sort of building on Kelsey's work, you got me in the interview when you basically said, at the public health, particularly the local community level, we've been giving all of this money to marketing agencies because we were suddenly told, hang on, you've got to create materials around COVID. And all of you were like, oh, and so all of these little agencies basically reap the rewards. Um, and so maybe just dig in a little bit to your visionary idea. Like, wh what does this mean if this actually works? How, how do you see the future looking? So Kelsey and I are really speaking the same language. In Western North Carolina, I work with um, it's 88% rural. Um, the communities we serve are very diverse within, within our region. And um, the materials that we receive um, from 
federal and state agencies who often have the funding to do health public health communications don't reflect our community. So we're experiencing, as you've heard from Kelsey, communities across the country are facing the same challenge. Um, and so, and, and the, it's not that we don't know our communities. Our health communicators have deep expertise when it comes to the kinds of information that their communities need, but they're not being met with the resources and tools to be able to deliver culturally competent localized health information from trusted messengers. And it's frustrating as a health communicator. Um, one thing that we did in Western North Carolina, as I mentioned, was form a health communicators collaborative. And the goal there, and it included public health agencies, hospitals, community health workers, community-based organizations, um, our um, local colleges, working together to meet the, to fill those gaps that we were seeing. And when COVID happened, we had already been together a year, we were able to raise the funds we needed to test some really core concepts. What would happen if we had the ability to tailor materials that we were getting from other agencies so that they reflected our communities? What would happen if we could support our local partners in placing ads digitally so that they could really strategically target their communities with information that's been branded and selected from local messengers because they know what their communities need to hear? What would happen if we had shared performance measures at the local and the regional level in this case so that we can tell the story of what we're doing, what's working, what's not working, what works to do better? And it was incredibly successful, but it was also very resource intensive and challenging to replicate and scale in other communities. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do this across the country. So the platform that I want to design and that I need to get funding for, if anyone has any ideas for me. Um, <laughs> or money down the back of the sofa. <laughs> I, I want to build a beautiful, easy to use platform so that a local health communicator, like Kelsey, for example, would be able to log into this platform, say, I'm working on this health topic. Here's who I'm trying to reach. Here are the materials that I need. And it would provide a beautifully curated um, list of here's some existing materials. They'd, she'd be able to select what would work best, tailor it, swap out images that highlight her own local community, tweak the language so that it reflects the language that is being used in her community, um, and then have support with setting it up with ad placement and, and, and shared measures. With this platform, there's a lot we can do, but one of the things I'm really excited about is being able to tell that story not just at a local level or on our a little community level because there's successes happening all over the country, but they're not connected. So how do we tell this story so that we can build the, the evidence base for public health communications that works? So um, as you can tell, I'm really excited <laughs> about it. I tried to get someone else to do this idea like three years ago and I couldn't convince anyone else to do it. So um, luckily I found Claire and Stephanie uh, <laughs> give me some support in figuring out how to make this thing happen because it's, it's, it's a big idea, but I think it's, it has the power to be really transformative. Yes. Um, Liz. So you are an infodemic manager. So first of all, I want you to explain to people what that is, but also your project is basically talking with people who are other infodemic managers about their experiences and using storytelling as a way to understand qualitatively what the last three years were like. So first of all, tell us about being an infodemic manager. And then I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and ask you to be a bit personal. Like if you were in one of these groups, what would you say? How would you talk about the last three years as somebody who was really doing this work? Yeah, so um, just to take a step back, um, the infodemic is actually a term that um, has been around in the literature for quite some time, but um, Dr. Tedros, the Director General for the World Health Organization, popularized it in February of 2020. He, he said, we're not just facing an epidemic, we're facing a, 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 an infodemic, um, and it's moving and evolving as rapidly as, as the virus. And so an infodemic is an overwhelming amount of information, including mis and disinformation that um, accompanies a pandemic or health emergency. Um, again, I come from an immunization background. We're no strangers to misinformation. In fact, some of the oldest uh, examples of vaccine misinformation in newspapers and popular literature are 300 years old. So we're not, we're not um, unknown to um, how misinformation and too much information and confusing or inaccurate information can really impact people's perceptions and behavior. Why do we care about this in public health? Because the infodemic, that overload, that cognitive overload, the inaccurate information, the confusing information, the outdated information, all of those things can impact people's health behaviors. And we saw that very clearly in the pandemic. 
So back in 2020, um, um, I was working at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and um, I was very lucky to work with a wonderful team um, at the World Health Organization in the um, Health Emergencies Program. And they were really trying to start thinking about how do we better address misinformation. Back in 2020, it was all about the misinformation. If we can just address the misinformation, that will, you know, we'll, we'll be able to help stop the pandemic faster. And then, you know, our understanding of this infodemic has since evolved. Uh, misinformation is a very small part of the overwhelming amount of information that's out there. Everyone who has a phone in their pocket has a screen that you probably had to like turn off the notifications at some point for your own mental health during the pandemic because it became overwhelming. So infodemic management is the science and the public health practice of how you manage an infodemic. Um, you can't completely get rid of it, you can't stop it altogether, but just like an epidemiologist is trained to detect a virus or detect a pathogen and follow the outbreak and then put a stop to it, um, usually which requires change in human behavior. Similarly, uh, someone who works as an infodemic manager detects, prevents, detects, and responds to uh, the infodemic, whether it's misinformation or too much information or overwhelming information and how it impacts specific organizations, communities, and groups of people. So um, infodemic management really has grown at WHO for the last few years. Um, I was very privileged to co-facilitate multiple infodemic manager trainings. We trained over 1,400 people globally from 120 countries on the many different skill sets that you need to be an infodemic manager. Um, and there is no such thing as a perfect infodemic manager. They don't exist. It's a unicorn. It's actually become the in-joke for this community because um, you, know, you need to be an epidemiologist. You need to understand how the internet works, um, digital analytics, uh, public health, understand health communication, behavioral science. I mean, you name it, there's going to be a facet to the infodemic that you're only starting to grasp. Um, just to give you an example, one of the first infodemiology conferences that were convened um, by WHO and by CDC and other partners, um, we had everything from theoretical physicists to human rights lawyers to epidemiologists to uh, journalists and all coming together to discuss this problem that we were really starting to see take hold in late 2020. But the thing is, is that we couldn't even agree on common definitions or terms. Surveillance means something very different for LUM as a journalist than it does for someone who's an epidemiologist, right? So even the terms that we use to describe this area is very different from person to person, as is the understanding. Um, there's also this patriarchal view of like, well, if we just tell the people the information, they will do the right thing and they will <laughs> get vaccinated and wear a mask and stay indoors and not move around and wash their hands. Um, I wouldn't have a job if people followed all public health guidance that was given to them. Um, and just for the several communicators who are working at state and local level, um, I also was a health communicator um, working at the global level and also helping support the COVID-19 response domestically. And it was really clear that pushing out more messages wasn't going to be sufficient. <laughs> and so just to say an infodemic manager really comes from that public health practice and that place of how do we understand the narratives, the conversations that people are having, the questions, the concerns, the information voids, and the circulating narratives and mis and disinformation. And the reason why that's important is that there are far more questions and concerns and information voids out there than there are mis and disinformation. And there's so much um, temptation to focus on the misinformation because that's the shiny object that everyone wants to deal with, that we're not plugging pretty basic information voids. And guess what? Not everything can be solved with a communications intervention. And I say that as a communicator. <laughs> so if you have a community that's really um, frustrated and anxious because they feel like they're not um, getting um, respectful and empathetic service delivery, they're not able to get vaccines even though that they want them, they feel they've been ignored early in the pandemic, they haven't received health services before the pandemic, the government didn't seem to care about them, and suddenly we've showed up on their doorstep and say, hey, you should get vaccinated. Um, do you think more messages are going to build that broken trust? Um, there's a report um, when I was at CDC that was written um, with a focus on the Native American community, and there was a line that really struck me, which is, what has the health system done to be worthy of trust? You know, our job is not to go into communities and build trust with them, like it should be the other way around. This recognition that um, we need to be worthy of trust as a health system, and that's an ongoing, that's an ongoing process. And so, um, to quote um, Barbara Reynolds, who um, is the goddess of crisis and emergency risk communication, which is kind of the Bible by which CDC talks about crises and communication, Mistrust and distrust is the, uh, a, a, from the outgrowth of the belief that promises were broken and values were violated. Mm -hmm. um, and when you break people's, uh, when you break your promises that you're making to people and you violate the values in terms of how you're offering health services, how you're communicating with them, um, that's a recipe for disaster. And we've seen this again and again all over the world. No country got it right, which is what makes infodemic management so interesting because we're all just starting to figure this out. 
Um, but just to say that 95% um, of countries are supposedly tracking vaccine misinformation and COVID misinformation. But on these surveys that are done by WHO, that's like asking, do you brush your teeth twice a day? Now, there's probably only one right answer to that question, right? So just to say everyone's worried about it, everyone's concerned about it, they want to do something about it, but they don't necessarily have the right humans with the right skill sets to do this work. So we train infodemic managers to be able to do this work. Um, and it's a huge different variety of humans. It can be the risk communications officer in the immunization program. It can be an epidemiologist sitting in the emergency operations um, center. It can be the health promotions officer at the district level. It can be the pharmacist talking to a patient who is not really sure if he wants to get the COVID vaccine, but has heard something about hydroxychloroquine or maybe ivermectin and is considering that as an alternative and wants that pharmacist's advice. You know, it's the fact that all of us um, who work in public health have like our public health day jobs. And then we turn on WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, and we have that uncle that sends us text messages about the latest crazy thing that they saw and just want to double check, like, is this for real or not? And then we have to deal with this in our personal lives. Um, so infodemic managers come in many stripes and many variations all over the world. Um, but there aren't any assessments of what have we learned in the last few years? Where did these people pop up? Where do they fit in their health systems? What have they, what have they tried? What worked? What didn't work? Um, how did it affect them professionally and personally? There's not a single infodemic manager that I know that wasn't also personally impacted by the infodemic because you yourself are like in the middle of this overwhelming overload, right? And health workers especially were heavily affected by this. You had doctors and nurses and health workers and community health workers, uh, people of all stripes all over the health system who were trying to do their best in the middle of a pandemic with not enough PPE, confusing guidance, not enough vaccines, uh, trying to do their best to deliver care to their communities, trying to address mis and disinformation from their patients. They're seen as members of their own community. And then you also have hesitancy among health workers themselves within hospital systems and health systems, wondering about the benefits of vaccination or taking some other type of mitigation measure. So just to say that the infodemic affected everyone, no country did it right. We all can learn a lot from this experience. And this particular project is this idea that um, we need to understand the qualitative experiences, the stories of those who've been working on the front lines of the pandemic and the infodemic and how it affected them. Because if we understand and listen and hear those stories um, and evaluate them in a, this participatory manner, um, we can better understand how to make the health systems work better to protect their health, their mental health, their well-being, and their ability to do their jobs um, for the next pandemic, for the next emergency. So for those who are not really into public health preparedness or you know pandemic preparedness and prevention, um, this year is a really big year. Um, there's the pandemic treaty that's being uh, currently discussed um, at the World Health Organization by many different countries who are all trying to plan for the next big thing. Um, and the infodemic is something that we didn't think about in previous pandemics or epidemics or outbreaks, not to the same extent that we did during COVID, but we better be better prepared next time around. And I'm hoping that those stories that we're trying to draw up in collaboration with WHO will help put a human face onto the people who've been on the front lines of this. Um, the harms of the infodemic are vast and we're still trying to understand like the impact, whether it's threats against health workers, public health officials being doxxed, you know, threats of violence against them, people overdosing on ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, um, stigmatization among Asian communities all over the world. I mean, the list goes on. There's so many harms that we're only really starting to understand. But this is one way we can capture the harms and then also the successes of the group of people that were really on the front lines of this. Personally, um, I've been involved with this for the last three years. I've been part of these WhatsApp groups with hundreds of infodemic managers that we've trained. And some of the stories that they share are really heartbreaking. Um, but I think are also important to hear. And the reason why stories are important, and I say this as somebody who has an undergrad degree in writing, um, stories are compelling and powerful because they take a wall of data and they boil it down to a singular experience that can also be a universal one. Um, stories are also... Liz, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are so passionate about this, but I'm just a little bit aware of time. Yes, so I'll just say <laughs> one more sentence. Just to say that like, stories can be a powerful way to manipulate people. Misinformation that spreads is often run on stories and emotion, but stories are also a powerful way for us to evaluate and understand the impact of an infodemic of the pandemic on people's experiences. And I hope my project can help bring that forward. Thanks, Liz. And I just want to move um, to Kelly, 
who, very similar to you, is kind of living her experience. So one of the reasons you're so passionate is because you've lived this for the last three years. And Kelly, you're doing a project that is based in your home country. Your family still live there. You're looking at air pollution. This is having real world life harms. How do you navigate this as like doing a project where this is very, very close to home and very personal? Thank you for that question, Claire. And I want to ground us all in thinking about, and as audience members too, that I hope you can tell that all of our projects are very personal to us. And I hope the audience members see too that they're personal to you as well, that we are existing in this room and for people on live stream, you're breathing likely in a room with, with clean air. You're able to take a full deep breath. And that's something that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the majority of the world can't do. Um, so when I, going back to Claire's question, when I think about the work that I'm doing with this project, I see my neighbor who is a farmer who has to go out to his rice fields every day and just breathe in the, the dirty air. Or I see um, my dad who sends me texts every morning about the air quality, like screenshots of the air quality in Chiang Mai. Or my grandma who, growing up, um, my mom helped her uh, work at this Thai, Thai tea stand on the side of a very busy road. And so those are the people, those are the faces, going back to Liz's point, those are the stories that I hold close to my heart when I do this work. Um, and I, I don't want to throw statistics at you because we all know, we all have the data to, to how climate change, how air pollution, how all of these environmental Injustice issues are affecting communities in the US in particular, you know, black, indigenous, Asian, Latinx communities are the ones who are um, heavily impacted by the negative effects of anything related to climate and environment. Um, w while at the same time, they're the ones least creating, cr creating that harm. Um, and then in Thailand, following similar fault lines in terms of health inequities. It's the communities that are the poorest, that live in the mountains, that don't have access to air purifiers, that aren't able to shut the windows of their homes because they, they, they need the air to survive. You know, they, they don't have access to, to the things that we have at an elite ivory tower institution like Brown or air purifiers that you know dot the homes in wealthy or well-to-do or more privileged families in Bangkok and Chiang Mai. And just to um, elaborate a little on my project, I am very aware that we have the data, like I said, we have the climate modeling, we have the physical sciences, but we don't have the tools to communicate the data. There's a very big gap right now with the physical and social sciences with marrying how um, we, we tell stories, uh, using data to tell stories. So that, that's the component that my project proposes to address, is to try to bridge the gap between um, physical sciences and social sciences through centering citizens' voices and stories in the air pollution crisis. A huge strain of misinformation in Thailand is the fact that air pollution is caused by a multitude of, of causes, including you know, crop burning, uh, road traffic, private polluting industries. And I think the, the majority of the Thai public are only aware that it's, it's, it's only the road traffic that's, that's causing it. It's only the, 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 um, the farmers, you know, burning crops in, in the mountains, burning their fields. But private polluting industry are really the main perpetrators of this crisis. And because they have so much um, power and sway in shaping the public narrative, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to really get the facts out there. So that's, that's the piece of, of this project too, is to try to really address that misinformation by centering people's voices who have worked in air pollution advocacy. I'm very involved with the um, Thailand Clean Air Network, and it's a group of people 
who have been doing this work for decades. So I'm just, you know, recently kind of joining their ranks. So I really want to acknowledge the work that they've been doing um, and trying to, in, in moving the needle. And I think going back to just what Claire mentioned with this work being very personal, um, and it's, it's something that, you know, keeps me up at night and it's something that I'm doing right now, like just breathing, breathing clean air. Um, that's the piece that really drives me and keeps, keeps me going with, with the fact, especially now thinking about how uh, between January and April, that's the period of time where air pollution is the worst in, in certain cities in Thailand. Um, and also being very aware of the fact that this is not just an issue that affects Thai people, that this is an issue that is, a, it's a global issue. Um, so hopefully with centering stories and trying to raise awareness around the air pollution crisis through storytelling with data, um, that will help move policy in Thailand and also other countries around the world as well. Thank you. Um, they're amazing, aren't they? So uh, I'm going to open it up to questions in a second, and we have a hashtag, because we're about information <laughs> futures, hashtag IFL panel. Um, this is rapid fire, team. This is honing your communication skills. I need a tweet length answer, which is, what does the world look like in 10 years' time if your project is successful? But also, in brackets, maybe there's somebody watching that can really help you. So if there's also something that you're like, I would really want money, I really want some connections, you should also say that. Um, okay, who wants to start? Well, Lan nearly swore when I said that, so I'm not going to start with you, lovely, and I'm going to start with Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years' time. Um, communities have the information that they need, that when they need it to help them have access to um, healthier lives. Um, and it's, it's not rocket science what we need to do here. It's really just putting the, the tools that we have, the, the technological digital tools in the hands of, of health communicators, not just in public health, but you know, those who are just anyone who has a role in, in trying to get credible health information to their communities. And that tweet has a gif of a rocket going up and then failing. Um, <laughs> it's not rocket science. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Sophia. <laughs> Young people across the UK, and maybe further afield as well, um, will feel happy and healthy online, and they'll be able every day to use content creation to transform their lives and the lives of others for the better. If my project is successful in 10 years' time, clean air will be recognized as a human right. In 10 years' time, folks of the BIPOC community will be able to see themselves in a variety of health facilities in their health materials. And health facilities and health organizations will also be better prepared to advertise and empower these different communities with health information. An infodemic manager in every health department in the United States and in every ministry of health um, that's empowered by working with people who actually understand how the internet works and why it's important to do a better job communicating about health topics there. I still don't have a good answer, but um, <laughs> we will find better ways to understand our neighbors, to be able to um, see them for who they are and understand the entirety of our neighborhood whether they are speaking Vietnamese or Chinese, whether they're black or Latino, whether they're selling water or not, whether they're having a barbecue at the lake or not, whether they're new people who moved in um, and are trying to find a better way of being a better neighbor in the neighborhood. I think hopefully in the way the kind of misunderstandings that we have in gentrifying neighborhoods right now really needs to be addressed. And I really hope that that is one part of it. That was pretty good, Lam, for somebody who said she didn't have a good answer. Um, Okay, friends, so we have about half an hour. Um, so if there's anybody in the room that would like to ask a question, there are two microphones. And I am going to look on a Google Doc to see if there's anything coming through the magic internet. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the, all you talk and all your work seems to kind of focus on the, the mechanism of the handling information. <laughs> Uh, which is important, and your work is so remarkable. 
So would you mind just, because it's a bit hard to hear for the live stream, so I think Samantha's got a magic microphone. Yeah, it's stuck. <laughs> Hi, how are you? That's lovely. You're here? Thank good, you. Good. Yeah. And it seems like uh, uh, what, what you involved in your work and, uh, and uh, the issue is the me mechanisms of handling information, uh, which by itself is totally remarkable you know, and important. But on the other hand, you know, there are the correctness right, and the trustworthy of the information which you receive. So how do you judge they are not misinformation, even disinformation? Now, just give you an example, okay? And early on in pandemic, right? And uh, the mask and was considered by, by world and you know, national authorities and not necessary preventive measures, right? Which clearly is the misinformation. But it could be disinformation as well because the tremendous shortage of the mask, right? And uh, perhaps there's test collusion among the world authorities and uh, not to advocate mandatory masking in public, try to save masks for, for people at risk. And uh, good ideas, but definitely, if that's true, I don't know, but it, it, that's disinformation, right? So how do you judge? the information received. Any of the health communicators want to, how did you deal with the mask issue? That the, the guidance changed? Um, so I think this goes back to the whole issue of, you know, you can have people just trust you very quickly by breaking your promises and value it and uh, violating it at their values, right? Um, and I think one of the main tenets for when you're communicating in a, in a health emergency is that you have to acknowledge what is known and what is not known. Uh, give the information that is actionable based on the latest evidence and then leave the door open saying we might learn more tomorrow and it might change tomorrow. Um, but if it does, we will tell you why. We'll tell you what has changed and we'll tell you why. And I think um, the mask issue is an issue that took place in many countries about confusion, um, about changing guidance, reasons why, um, uh, you know, how was the virus spread, what kind of mask and which situation is best. Um, and some of that is wrapped up in mis and disinformation, but a lot of it also just comes down to evolving science, confusing guidance being issued, um, and, and that leading to people being naturally confused. Um, so I think it's really important that um, we recognize with humility that um, in general we could be doing a better job as health communicators to communicate to the public this uh, difference between what we know and what we don't know and that we're trying to give the best information we can so that people can make the best health decisions they can for themselves and their families without knowing all the facts, right? If I can jump in too, mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. And I think it's really important to have consistent communication so that when we do need to pivot and, and, and address where we are wrong in, in information as public health, um, for example, that we have that trust. So that's like communications 101. And that's part of what I want to address with, with building this platform that's supporting health communicators, not just showing up when there's a crisis, because then they, people aren't used to hearing from them. They don't have those trust and relationships. And to your point about, about it being very focused on um, the mechanism, I think, for example, part of what, I, what I'm hoping to do with this platform is acknowledge that we need tools to create lift for, lo for local and regional and state communicators so that they're able to focus on the work that they can do best face-to-face uh, -face interpersonally with that relationship building and community engagement that will build public health and trust and, trust and help um, address mis- and disinformation and malinformation when it's happening. Yeah. So you live with this. Uh, so what you essentially say is honesty and humility is the virtue. Yeah. And uh, the government and the world authority should just say, you know, we need a rational mask, right? And they instead to try to make up a story. I think um, people. I, no, think, no, no, you know, I don't know where the truth is, but. No, but. I, I think the, the bottom line is that um, I think most people working in public health do want to do the best they can with the information that they have mm -hmm. and want to communicate as clearly as they can. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a lot of confusion, and it doesn't help when you have different states or different countries all having the same information, but all making different recommendations to the public about what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can also lead to mistrust and distrust. So just to say, I think it's important to acknowledge if we've learned something new and why we've changing guidance. That's really critically important. 
But uh, actually, I'm a physician, but you know, just to kind of elaborate a little bit, because and uh, it, it seems kind of almost you know unbelievable, right? Masks may have been proven to be useful in all airborne droplet transmission, you know, of of viruses. I mean, how could world expert can't uh, cannot not not acknowledge that? Thank you. So um, this is a question not so much about your projects, but more about you. Um, so we know that you didn't come here just out of thin air, right? You've been working on, on a lot of the work that you're pursuing for some time. Um, so a question that often gets asked in interviews is, you know, in five years, where do you see yourself? <clears throat> So the question is, five years ago, did you see yourselves here? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the thread? What's the thread between five years ago and right now? Um, I can start. Well, five years ago, um, I was a junior at San Diego State University, and I had just changed my major. Um, from biology to health communications, uh, very last minute. I do not recommend doing that. Um, but it came as a change after getting to meet the Deputy Surgeon General of the United States. I went to a presentation that she had, and she was really talking about how, yes, doctors need to be able to communicate with their patients, but we also need to have folks who can help prevent them from even going to the doctor in the first place. And that really resonated with me because at that time I didn't know if I really wanted to go to med medical school. And I realized there's an other, another path for me to be able to help people. And it's through allowing myself to help educate them to make choices so they can live healthier and happier lives without having to go to the doctor or have to take in a bunch of prescriptions or potentially having a particular illness and it not being diagnosed correctly or on time. And so I wanted to be able to gain the resources um, through the health communications program, but also through the cultural proficiency program on how to merge the two together on the cultural proficiency side and the health side to really be able to talk to different communities, different ages, different backgrounds about health so they can make these decisions to live these uh, healthier and happier lives. Thanks, Kelsey. And I can go next. I love the question, Leah. Thank you. Uh, five years ago, I was a senior in college and definitely thinking about next steps post-grad. Um, the summer of my junior year, so leading up to my senior year, I conducted a study on HIV AIDS related stigma and how stigma affected people's, people living with HIV's means and experiences of treatment and receiving care. Uh, and I conducted the study at a in a pretty rural area in Chiang Mai, again, my hometown, um, called San Patong. And I think the common thread, Leah, is community and storytelling because the work that informed my study and also informed my postgrad decisions around like first job was how do I best center storytelling and center the community and the work that I'm doing? I think as then as now, I am very aware that I'm just one person. And at the end of the day, how can I truly make a difference? Um, and it's, it's the questions I constantly ask myself now, same set of questions I ask myself then, which is where do my skills and experiences and knowledge best meet opportunity and gaps that exist in the world? And I'm very much grounded in the community that I grew up in, that I'm from. Um, so always kind of that saying that's like, you bloom where you're planted, um, that really always holding the, the community close to, to the work that you're doing. Um, and yeah, I, I know there's a lot of college students in this room, so hopefully that's 
that's just some a, a takeaway you can you can take because I definitely did not expect myself to um, be in this position now in terms of just the work that I get to do every day with communities in Asia and the Pacific and just the even if even if the project isn't as successful as I envision it to be, hopefully maybe I make just a little dent in the air pollution space. So, um, And there's somebody standing up, so I, <laughs> I've definitely had to wait for another four people. So let's hear your question then go back to the last one. Okay, got you. I, uh, I certainly don't mean to cut anything off. I'm Lavelle Williams. I'm a uh, second year MPH student at the School of Public Health. Um, really, glad, really great to see you guys. I'm also in health communications. Um, and my question is, you know, a lot of times the largest voice with the audiences that we're trying to reach is a non-public health voice, but they're still the largest voice. That might be a politician or a social media influencer or whatever. Um, so my question is, how are you thinking about using partnerships with the largest voice, whoever that may be, in order to increase the reach of your endeavor? That's a great question. Thanks, Lavelle. Who wants to go first? Lam. Uh, I think I can put the two together, wow. especially for you as well. <laughs> um, Five years ago, I found myself on a block in Harlem, in 136th Street. It's a largely Dominican black neighborhood where there had been 3,000 noise complaints in one year, uh, in three years. That means on average there were three per year. The police kept showing up and showing up and showing up because they were, there was a person who kept on filing those noise complaints. It was a lopsided type of um, um, uh, uh, dynamic that I kept seeing, like the quality of life complaints really, really determined how a neighborhood was managed, was governed, was like policed, right? And those quality of life complaints came from a very small, affluent minority in some ways, like a lot of new gentrifiers moving in. And one of the things that this story was important for me, it was very pivotal, because before that, I was a journalist who was beholden to the economic woes of whatever institution was there and was saying, like, you need to break news. You need to do prosecutorial investigations and get someone fired. Do something for the powerful, right? And this was a story that came out of hearing from the public. We want to know about the barbecue Beckys. Is this a real thing or is this just a viral incident? Is this something that we have felt for our entire lives? Is this true? And I found a way of doing this statistically. I was able to see through 17 million rows of data, figure out a way of um, sort of like, with enough statistical, I hope confidence proves that there's a correlation between um, gentrification and more calls to police about folks like the Dominican folks on that block. And it was the most beautiful, like transformative story for me because it actually got all of the players involved that you're talking about. For me, that moment was a really pivotal point where it became clear of who is this project for? Who is my work for? I don't want to just serve like investigative journalism to um, the powers to be. I want to be able to translate that onto different levels. And local politicians pick this up. Other po folks like um, uh, policymakers, people who are like um, um, advising the White House and so on, were like writing it into uh, their academic journals. But for me, the most powerful thing was it was taken by mutual aid groups and then people were like, stop calling the police. Here's a BuzzFeed story from like three years ago that shows that calling the police leads to over-policing of black and brown neighbors, right? And it's, it was really an interesting way of understanding that the economic incentives and the political incentives for you to serve only that group should only be a, a, a smaller part of that. You can make the economics for yourself work in some ways. I quit my job at BuzzFeed like a year and a half ago. I did not see that coming. I had full-time jobs for the whole time. I really wanted to figure out a way of doing journalism that was ethically aligned with my moral compass, that really centered the people who I saw both as subjects of my journalism and as my audience, which is not always the case. And so I think there's a way in which then you just take the bits and pieces that you have. And then you think about, who is this for? Okay, you know what? I bulletproofed my, my like center of the story with like 70 million rows of data and some gentrification analyses and like a lot of the wonky stuff that I need to shave off a layer of trolls and like 
I don't know, like please the, the policy gods, right? And it was cited in some academic journals and so on, but like for me, the more, the more important point, and it goes to, um, to Kelly's point as well, is that when you center human beings in that too, you can get people to care about this. In this case, my editor was like, find me someone who sat on that block for a long time and who had to change the way his life, um, uh, he, uh, the way he led his life because someone came in and kept calling the cops on him, right? Because of noise. And I found a 105-year-old man. His name was Ramon Hernandez, and he was sitting on that block. And um, I kid you not, that man got people on the ground in Harlem, in the neighborhood, like excited about like something that was really wonky and quantitative. And I think there's a way of treading that line where you can really provide a service when you really think about who is it for. And I understand that the policymakers matter, but you can kind of like figure out a way of addressing them both, whether it's through separate packages of the same information, or whether it's a way of like really winning them over with virality. To some degree, like these days, yes, there's the New York Times op-ed board and like all of these other places, but you can make, like similar to Sophia, you can make your own audience and figure out a way of forcing this down their throats. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that is a good thing to end on, huh? <laughs> um, so yeah, would anybody else like to answer either of those questions? I just, either or I just wanted to add, um, it's not always the, you don't always have to be the loudest person in the room. Um, a lot of people think that to make change, you have to have some fancy title, go to the fanciest of schools, have all of the degrees, but in reality, it's normal people without those who really do make the changes that we need to see in the world. Um, at Roots Community Health Center, people do not know that I, most people do not know that I went to school and I have a master's in public health. They just know me as a photographer and someone who runs the social media page. And it actually works in my favor because it doesn't cause any intimidation. It allows me to be able to talk to people and really get down to the, the essentials of what is affecting them. I can ab I'm able to help answer their questions or find the solutions to be able to solve their problems. Um, and so with that, we kind of, at this point in time, we Roots Community Health Center runs a weekly, I guess, newscast called the People's Health Briefing. We kind of take a uh, note of what is going on in the community of East Oakland. We field questions that are coming from community members so we can make sure that we're answering the questions that they have. Um, and it probably wouldn't exist, one, without the pandemic, but two, without these community voices. Using that, that would be the largest, our largest platform, um, but we are not the loudest voice. We allow that with that, um, broadcast, it allows us to give community members that voice. Thanks, Kelsey. Sophia. Um, to answer Leah's question, uh, no, I did not think I would be at Brown five years ago. Uh, I just became a religion reporter at the BBC World Service at the time, and I've been on quite the journey since. Um, Sometimes, pe uh, and my main area, I'm a generalist at Vice World News, but my main area of coverage and my book is all about uh, what I call the sex misinformation crisis, but uh, um, sexual and reproductive health and rights and justice. And sometimes in interviews I get asked, whoa, religion to sex. And for me, <laughs> that's really a really obvious and clear link between the two, and seeing some nods, um, thinking about how our faith or simply ethical values impact our lives beyond the obvious auspices of religion or ethics. And um, it, it, now I can look back, and it's very, very clear how, um, the, as I did expand into reporting on sexual and reproductive health, you know, even in, it, was, it is evident in the lives of people I interview every day, as well as my own personal experience, both, both Catholic and secular messaging, destroyed my relationship with my body before I ever had a chance to explore it. And I think a lot of people have a similar experience. And that's when you, when you look at, oh, our sex education is rubbish. And then something like that happens. Of course, there's a link. Of course, we can do so much better for people. 
Um, I also think that no journalist should know or anticipate what they are going to be in five years' time because the media landscape is changing too fast. TikTok was but a twinkle in my eye at that point. <laughs> but I had just successfully pitched the BBC World Service Instagram account. They weren't on Instagram. By the end of my first year, they had 60,000 followers, an account I was manning or womaning all by myself. Um, so I really think that is important to kind of not quite know the route that you're going to take, to be adaptable, because you never know what incredible opportunity is around the corner or story that you, you need to tell that you just haven't met yet. Thank you, Sophia. Liz? Um, I'll give a really specific example. And just to say, we've only got four minutes left. Okay. <laughs> So um, in 2018, um, uh, India um, embarked on one of the most ambitious vaccination campaigns in the history of the world. They were going to vaccinate half a billion, that's with a B, a children against measles and rubella vaccine. Um, they, in the first round, they picked states that had higher, um, higher routine immunization levels, um, that had higher education, you know, the easy states, you know, where you would have very high vaccine uptake for this massive campaign to reach children ze ages 0 to 14 years old. It failed horribly, and so they asked um, colleagues from the CDC to come and, and basically figure out why. Why did this go so poorly? Um, and part of it was there was a massive amount of misinformation circulating on WhatsApp about um, the, the measles rubella vaccine, and that was causing hesitancy. Um, but there's a variety of other things, like, you know, if you Googled measles, MR vaccine or measles rubella vaccine in Google India, the first two pages were just news stories that had horrific headlines like, beware of myths about MR vaccine. And then there's a picture of a screaming 14-year-old girl literally being held down and forcibly vaccinated. And 90% of the article was all the myths associated with the Mises rubella vaccine. But at the end it says, but don't worry, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, UNICEF and WHO recommend that you get your child vaccinated for Mises rubella vaccine. Now, if I were a parent and I, would, and if I saw that and I was just trying to do some basic information search, I would be horrified and maybe might not choose to vaccinate my child. So the point was is that the Ministry of Health website was research result number 26 in Google because they didn't even have a page describing measles rubella vaccine and the one page they did have was written for doctors not for parents not for educators not for the general public um, where do you bury dead body the second page of Google search engine results so you know I basically pitched this to the deputy commissioner for the immunization program saying you have to step up your your online game because the other side is winning. <laughs> you know, you're not even providing basic, credible, accurate information, and you're so worried about the misinformation circulating on WhatsApp. You're not providing a counter argument, um, and you need to step it up. And and they did. Um, but that's just, I think, for me, the the light bulb moment of um, we need to be bringing something better to the gunfight because right now we're bringing the equivalent of bananas to the gunfight. Like, how do we make the credible, accurate health information as compelling and as interesting as the misinformation and the counter narratives? And that's, I think, the issue for all of you to try and help solve. Um, how do we do this better in the future so people will want to vaccinate their children, they'll want to do the healthy thing that we're recommending that they do um, versus listening to the misinformation that is so emotionally compelling? Liz, what a segue. <laughs> what a freaking segue because, where is it? Oh, look at this. So some of you here, I think, have already signed up for this, and I'm so excited about it. But if you have not, and you're just hearing all of this, and you're like, I would love to be trained in ways to understand the information ecosystem and respond in a way that's really helpful. I wonder if such a project exists on campus. Well, people, it does. And via the power of a QR code, you yourself can train up you can sign up to be trained, and if you do the training, like, I would love to come every Monday evening and spend time with Claire and Pizza, you can do this every single week and with our team. So we are launching the Information Project on campus, and we're really excited about it. So if anybody at any level, including staff and anybody who wants to do this, because it affects everybody, we would love to train you, and we would love you to be part of this project that's going to be an ongoing attempt by us to build a community here of people who have these kind of skills and learn as we're all learning. So thank you, my six wonder children. That was amazing. Um, thank you for the questions. And if anybody wants to stay around and mingle, uh, we will be mingling outside. But thank you to people on the live stream. Um, and hopefully we'll see you somewhere very soon. So thank you again.